They say money can't buy happiness, although some have certainly tried, sparing no expense in building their absolute dream car. In another video, we looked into the founder of Midnight, who used his wealth to pay for Porsche's own racing division to modify his 911 to be the ultimate street racer. But there's another car, also bearing the iconic Midnight stickers, which cost exponentially more, leaned on more connections, and had even more impact. Some say it saved Lamborghini altogether. Stranger still, this supercar prowls the streets of Japan sporting more than just the iconic Midnight stickers, but also Canadian flags. While money may not be able to buy happiness, this rags to riches story shows how it can fuel an automotive passion strong enough to truly change the world. This is the story of the Canadian wolves prowling Japan. This story begins with one of the most interesting men to ever enter the world of motorsports. He won a Ferrari 512BB in a handshake bet with Enzo Ferrari, had his own line of perfumes, cigarettes, watches, wheels, steering wheels, motorcycles, scooters, and more. He owned a winning F1 team and was wanted by the largest police organization in the world. But when the Austrian-born Walter Wolf came to Canada after the Second World War, he had only $50 in his pocket. To make his money, Walter began working as a diver, installing pipes and building bridge foundations for a company called KD Marine, which was nearing bankruptcy. But Walter saw potential, so he took a cut in his pay and a loan to acquire as many shares in the company as possible. This decision caused him to lose money at first, and he had to take even more loans to develop new technology. But it started to pay off when the company, now solely owned by Wolf, started signing some big money contracts. He continued to expand the company, growing it into an international powerhouse. In 1973, he purchased a tanker full of crude oil. Then, the oil crisis hit, causing the price of oil to go through the roof and making Walter Wolf around $100 million overnight. While this was great for Mr. Wolf, it wasn't so great for Lamborghini, which was almost wiped out completely. Lamborghini had come a long way from salvaging military vehicles to make tractors, and had even released the world's first supercar thanks to a crack team of employees in their 20s, working after hours to build their dream chassis. The body was also designed by a 25-year-old Marcello Gandini at Bertoni, who sketched out one of the most beautiful cars ever made in just two days. This car was of course, the Miura. Ferruccio Lamborghini actually wanted to stay away from sports cars and focus on reliable, comfortable Grand Tours, but his young team pushed to give the car a chance. Sure enough, consumers loved the Mura, and the orders rolled in, even if it had some growing pains. There were high speed stability concerns, lift off oversteer issues, and more. But the big problem was that the company wasn't making money, and Ferruccio was on the verge of packing it in. However, in a last-ditch effort, he gave full responsibility to one of the young engineers, Paolo Stanzani. Paolo turned to Marcello Gandini again, who had been working on all kinds of wild, wedge-shaped cars, and the two actually moved in together to begin working on their long-shot attempt to save the company. While working on their love child, there was a Piedmontese worker who barely spoke any Italian. One of his go-to words was kuntak, which literally means contagion or plague, but can also be used as an exclamation of wonder or astonishment. Gandini joked that they should call their new car the kuntak, and, well, they did, kicking the tradition of giving the cars bullfighting names. The Kuntash once again demanded attention, and brought all kinds of quirks to the table, like being the first production car to feature scissor doors. The doors weren't just for looks either, but were actually necessary as the driver needed to open them up and lean out of the car while reversing if they wanted to see anything. The first run of Countach's even had a built-in periscope to help with the lack of visibility inherent to the wedge-shaped supercar. While the car had lots of challenges to face, it did address many of the Mura's shortcomings and looked like it could be the victory Lamborghini so desperately needed. However, it entered production in 1974 right into the wake of the oil crisis and a time when most consumers were looking to vehicles like the Ford Pinto instead. Ferruccio had lost faith in the company and sold his remaining 49%. But 
But there was one now very rich man who wasn't at all phased by the oil prices and wanted the meanest car he could get his hands on. And so Walter Wolf was the first customer in the world to get his very own Countach. Chassis 1120006. Walter got this VIP status because he already had a couple Miras and eventually got one of only 150 SVs made. Lamborghini also installed a super rare spoiler on the car, the same spoiler mounted on the Mira Jota SVR. The Jota was the brainchild of Bob Wallace, a chief test driver at Lamborghini who was one of the youngsters working overtime to develop the Mira in the first place. The Jota was lighter, more powerful, had all new suspension, a splitter, and even had fuel tanks in the doors to improve weight distribution. This last bit seemed like a great idea until the car was crashed and erupted into flames. Still, the Jota inspired the Mura SVJ and many lookalikes. Regardless, Wolf didn't like the wing on the Countach and had it removed from the car as soon as he got it. At the time, this car would have been insane, but for Walter Wolf, it still wasn't enough. So he commissioned Lamborghini's ex-chief designer, Gianpaolo Dallara, who made him a car more to his liking. And when it finally arrived, he returned his ultra-rare Countach to Lamborghini, who in turn promptly sold it to a country experiencing a supercar boom, Japan. The Countach was one of the contributing factors to the supercar boom sweeping the country, although the Miura certainly played its part too. Another big factor was a manga known as Circuit no Okami, or the Circuit Wolf. The main character drives the Lotus Europa and competed against all kinds of cool European cars, like the Porsche 911 Turbo, De Tommaso Pantera, and of course, the Countach. For school kids, the coolest thing to have at the time was an eraser shaped like your favorite supercar, as you could essentially bring toys to school while arguing with your teacher that you needed them for class. The success of the Circuit Wolf led to a live action movie and a whole museum you can still visit today. Some Japanese companies began producing their own wedge-shaped cars too, like the Dome Zero, which was only 38.6 inches tall. As the boom continued to grow, there were even supercar events, where people went crazy just to see the cars and could pay extra to sit inside of them. One of the most memorable cars at these events was Walter Wolf's next Countach, chassis 1120148. Gianpaolo Dallara had his hands full trying to meet Mr. Wolf's demands. Walter might have gone to Lamborghini to make his custom Countach, but they were having all sorts of management issues with Ferruccio gone. Paolo's engineering firm rejigged the car suspension and installed some wide teledial Campagnolo rims, inspired by the ones found on the Lamborghini Bravo concept car. For tires, the 225 width was nowhere near enough for Mr. Wolf's ambitions. So we called the Pirelli and convinced him to make super wide 345 width tires, the first in the world. To enclose the new kicks, the car had fiberglass wheel arches added, along with the front spoiler, all of which was painted black. Walter even asked Delara if he could bolt on an F1 wing, but it didn't quite work, and they ended up installing a custom one instead. To top it off, Lamborghini joined in and loaned a more powerful 5 liter engine, supposedly making 440 horsepower. This was a prototype engine and what the Countach was meant to come with. But due to reliability issues, they changed from the 5 liter to a 3.9 liter and changed the name from LP500 to LP400. While Lamborghini had the car at their factory, they were blown away by how much better it was and made their own copies of it for research and development. Other very rich people wanted copies of Walter Wolf's Countach too. And Walter? Well, he was already on to the next one, chassis 112002. This time he commissioned a Bugatti blue and gold car, with even more Canadian flags and an electronically adjustable wing which could be controlled from the cabin. The bigger prototype engine was also transferred over from the red car, which again was sold and made its way over to Japan, appearing not just in the supercar shows, but even starring on the big screen. Lamborghini is often associated with bulls, a result of Ferruccio being a Taurus, but the Countach seems to run into a lot of wolves. Walter Wolf, the Circuit Wolf, the Countach and Wolf of Wall Street, which was crashed while filming, and now a movie titled Yomigairu Kinru, The Resurrection of the Golden Wolf. Originally a novel, this film stars Asakura, a man who leads a double life, both as an office worker and as a criminal. Unlike most movies, he's not a likable protagonist, 
but rather executes immoral and highly illegal schemes for his own selfish ambitions. The grand payoff for all of this is a memorable scene in which he buys a Kuntash and drives it down the streets outside the Meiji Memorial Museum as his emotions overcome him. As you can tell, this is Walter Wolf's first custom Kuntash. The car in this cinematic moment seemed to have struck a chord with many enthusiasts across Japan, including the future owner of the car. But for Wolf, it was just a stepping stone in his endless search for a better car. His third and final Countach was an LP400S, a variant which was basically a production version of his own creations, as customers no longer wanted a stock model after seeing what was possible. Due to his immense influence, it's no surprise Wolf received the first one ever sold, chassis 1121002. This one was a darker navy blue, and after being displayed at the Geneva Motor Show, was finished with gold stripes, Wolf's logos, and another big wing. Lamborghini chose not to install the wing on the LP400S as it actually hindered the car's performance. But customers didn't care, and forced Lamborghini into selling them the option as well. To push the envelope further, Walter's car was later upgraded with 8-piston brake calipers, a racing clutch, adjustable brake balance, a digital dash, and more. Again, the 5-liter was ripped from his second car and placed in the new one. The second car was returned to Lamborghini, and it wasn't sent to Japan this time, but remained in Europe. So, was third time the charm for Walter? Was he finally satisfied with his third custom Countach? Of course not, although to be fair, he had an even bigger project on his hands, as he now owned and ran an F1 team. Wolf originally tried to convince Lamborghini to join F1 with him, but they maintained their aversion to racing. So instead, he bought assets from Frank Williams, but after a disappointing season, he removed Frank from management and went fully private into 1977, without a single sponsor. Wolf made a lucrative offer to driver Jody Schechter, and in Argentina, at the newly formed team's first ever race, they won. This was a tough season too, with competition like Niki Lauda racing with Ferrari. At the highly anticipated Monaco Grand Prix, Walter Wolf made a handshake bet with Enzo Ferrari himself, which resulted in him winning a 512 BB, thanks to Schechter holding off Lauda to win the Grand Prix. The Wolf team still wasn't done winning though, and the car with the Canadian flags won again in Canada. Wolf's team finished fourth in the Constructors' Championship with just one car, and Jody finished second in the Drivers' Championship, both incredible accomplishments for a brand new team and feats that will likely never be repeated. The following years, the team didn't do too well, with Jody being poached by Ferrari and Wolf signing James Hunt. James Hunt was a former champion and the biggest playboy F1 has ever seen. He had incredible talent, but this was at the tail end of his career, and he had lost his killer instinct after an accident he felt responsible for the previous year. Hunt retired from F1 in 1979, and Wolf sold his F1 team. Of course, he wasn't done with cars though, and continued to acquire all kinds of wild vehicles. One of the coolest he received was a Porsche 935, also in 1979. To get the car, Walter Wolf again made a phone call, this time to the Kremer brothers. Kremer knew the 935 better than anyone, and some would argue better than Porsche themselves, as their own variant of the 935, the K3, had just won the 24 Hours of Le Mans, also in 1979. But Walter had a strange request. He wanted the Kremer brothers to build him the only street-legal Porsche 935 in the world. He actually tried getting Porsche to make it first, but they turned down this wild request, especially because Wolf wanted the car to be as similar as possible to the Le Mans winner. To make it street legal, a few lights, the interior from a 930, and a custom exhaust which apparently took 6 months to develop were added, but it's still a miracle the factory car made it onto the streets. The 2.85 liter twin turbo flat 6 was detuned from 840 to 745 horsepower for reliability. But again, this was still wild, and the Wolf 935 hit 210 miles per hour on the Autobahn in 1979. This is almost the exact same speed as today's GT2 RS, so you might think, just maybe, that this car would finally tide Mr. Wolf over for a while. But no. As always, he had other cars coming and going, like a BMW M1 Pro car and a Ferrari 288 GTO. The 935 was sold to a Swiss collector, and his third and final Countach was also sold, with this one going to Japan as well. 
In Japan's supercar craze, the relatively small country had managed to snap up Walter Wolf's first Countach and two of the three custom cars. Enthusiasts were still hungry for more, with many Countach owners taking inspiration to build their own dream, like the L500R, while others simply modified their car to look exactly like a Mr. Wolf creation. In addition to the Wolf cars and lookalikes, Japan had accumulated all kinds of unique and impressive Lamborghinis. From modified Muras, which would break the heart of a purist, to some insane Countaches over the years. One of the craziest was a Countach owned by Teruaki Terai, which made its way into the JGTC. The team worked away at changing the aluminum bodywork for fiberglass to save weight, and tried to dial in the aerodynamics, but they were running out of time and money for much else. They didn't even have a driver, so they asked Ikizawa Satoshi, who wasn't a driver, but instead the author of the Circuit Wolf. Needless to say, the Countach didn't have the best performance that season, with its best race landing in 8th place. Unfortunately, Terai passed away from a tumor the following year. But as a result of his hard work, the team continued to enter different Lamborghinis, and eventually won. So, with enough work, the Countach really could compete on the track. But what about on the streets? Apparently, there were a surprising amount of Countaches roaming the street racing circuit back in the day. Some as chase cars just watching, while others went all out. Unfortunately, most of these racers didn't last long, as the Countach had to win not just against the opposition, but also itself, as the car seemed to be plagued with reliability issues, especially on the long, high-speed jaunts. But against the odds, there was one Countach which made its way into the ranks of Midnight. And it wasn't one of Walter Wolf's. The Ghost White Countach in Midnight was a QV5000, made in 1988, more than a decade after Walter Wolf's Countaches. This newer model was no joke, as Lamborghini finally felt confident enough to release the car to the public with a bigger 5.2 liter V12, making for a very quick streetcar. But of course, the Midnight Countach wouldn't remain stock for long. This car is a mysterious one, but thankfully there are a few pictures which help outline the story some of which the owner likely didn't want the world to see. The first of the mysterious Countach appears to have been taken on November 25th, 1990. The car is white with red interior and doesn't have the iconic stickers yet, but it's parked beside a car which does, and a well-known one at that. The 300ZX pictured is owned by Isao Mizoda, the head honcho at Revolf. Mizoda and the 300ZX are a lot easier to track down than the Countach, as they're both still proudly standing in the Revolf tuning shop, with the exact same license plates and stickers still on the car. The shop is filled with memoirs from the good old days, including a plaque from Option, celebrating the car hitting 328.4 km an hour. Mizoda is an incredible tuner, and has proven his ability to tune just about anything over the years, including the white Countach. After years of tuning and modification, the Countach had slowly evolved into a completely different beast. Many of the changes were done specifically to improve performance on the Wangan, like roof-mounted ducts for added cooling, a wing that was actually useful along with aero bits at every corner, and fixed headlights which could be used without having to pop them up and mess up the aerodynamics. It even had a Jota badge on it. Unfortunately, there never was a Jota edition made of the Countach, so this must be what the owner thought it would look like if it did exist. The car hadn't been seen on the streets for quite a while, but began showing up at tracks across Japan until a fateful day at Sotogara Forest Raceway, where once again a speed hunter was there to capture an insightful moment into the secrets of midnight. The event was the Tokyo Bayside Classic Cup, and among the miscellaneous class entries was the Midnight Countach. The car instantly caught the attention of photographer Blake Jones, who took all kinds of great photos of the car getting ready and doing its warm-up lap. After just one lap, the Countach switched into attack mode. As it chased down a 911, this blurry photo was the last one taken before a disaster. The Lamborghini dove inside of the 911 before the turn, but locked up the brakes and spun into the inside barrier before being bounced across the track and into the grass. The invaluable car was heavily damaged and was brought to the paddock with a forklift while the owner made the long walk back. What happened next is really strange though. The driver of the 911, also a Midnight member, began removing the Midnight stickers from the Countach. But why? The comments on the Speed Hunter article had lots of theories. Many people had heard the rumors of Midnight's strict policies and figured that the crash meant that the car and owner had instantly been banished from the club. 
But speculation in the comment section came to an end before long, as the Speedhunters article had been removed from the website. The reason being, Midnight themselves had reached out and had asked that the article be taken down. So, was the owner kicked out of Midnight? Was the 911 driver exiling him the owner of Blackbird? I'm afraid Tofu Fox here is out 10 bucks. Today's Midnight Racing team is very different from the one that formed in 1982, but there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great that the members of Midnight have transitioned away from illegal racing and can enjoy taking their cars to the track and shows while maintaining old friendships. Many of the members are well known, like Azai Mizoda of Revolf, and even his friend, the Kuntash's owner, Eichi Eddie Okawa. Like many other school kids at the time, Eddie's interest in supercars was sparked by the Circuit Wolf, and when the first Walter Wolf came to Japan, his dad paid the fee so that they could both sit inside it. Seeing the iconic scene in The Resurrection of the Golden Wolf further cemented his obsession. So it's no surprise that Eddie went on to not just buy the white Midnight Countach, but also open his own Lamborghini specialty shop, the walls of which are plastered in the memorabilia which ignited Eddie's passion. Right after opening the shop, another Countach went up for sale. And while this one was a lot of money, Eddie took it as a sign and decided to buy it. This Countach was the first Walter Wolf special, the one he'd sat in so many years ago. After the resurrection of the Golden Wolf was filmed, the rare car was actually purchased by a Buddhist monk, which didn't sit well with some, who accused him of spending donation money to buy it. But that didn't stop him from enjoying the car for many years before selling it. Once Eddie got the car in his possession, he made sure to put the Canadian flag's Walter head back on, and also added his own twist, and put the Midnight stickers on too. So while the Walter Wolf car may not have been raced on the Wangan in the glory days of Midnight, it is owned by an actual member who's earned his stripes, or stickers. One of the great things about Eddie is that he actually drives his extremely valuable cars, often taking the Walter Wolf Countach out to recreate the iconic shot from the resurrection of the Golden Wolf, or taking the white one out to track days like the one which nearly totaled the car. But it didn't. And after some impressive work, the car was restored to its former glory, and is back out there racing, cruising, and inspiring others. Eddie truly is a Lamborghini specialist, and even runs a blog filled to the brim with info. But there's another man in Japan who's a full-blown Walter Wolf aficionado, and the owner of the third and final Walter Wolf special, Shinjiro Fukuda. Fukuda had a similar childhood to Eddie, also developing an obsession for supercars which eventually became laser focused on all things Walter Wolf. He founded a successful engineering firm that has allowed him to fund his dream and purchase not just the Countach, but a huge collection of cars, many of which have Walter Wolf liveries, like the Maserati MC12 and a Vector W8. He even has a full-on Walter Wolf team in the Japanese Porsche GT Cup series with his crew all wearing Wolf branded attire. He's the only person in the world who has approval from Walter Wolf himself to use his branding, and has even opened Walter Wolf Racing Japan. It looks like an amazing shop, and they seem to have a great time, having hosted Fabio Lamborghini, Ferruccio's nephew, and of course, Walter Wolf himself. Not everyone is as fond of Walter as Fukuda though, and Interpol, the world's largest police organization, actually had an arrest warrant for him after he was implicated in an arms-related bribery scandal which aided in bringing down the Slovenian government. Wolf denies the allegations and seems to be doing alright, traveling the world in between relaxing in his W-shaped pools at his 7,000 acre ranch back in Canada. With so much money, he's been involved in a lot of political issues over the years. But this video is about the cars, which are all doing well. The first and third Walter Wolf custom builds are in Japan while the second is in Germany. All three are in great shape and often make public appearances, sometimes with the renowned Lamborghini driver Valentino Balboni behind the wheel. The original Midnight Countach is back on its feet and so is Lamborghini, thanks in part to the Wolf cars aiding in R&D and defining what the company is today. This car today was described to me as the car that saved Lamborghini because the company was in dire financial straits. They even brought back a variant of the Countach for its 50th anniversary, the LPI 804, 
featuring a naturally aspirated V12 paired to a hybrid system putting out over 800 horsepower and a 0 to 60 of just 2.8 seconds. Only 112 units of this limited edition Countach were made, and they sold for around 2.6 million US dollars. Although, if you want one now, it might be closer to 7 million. So, is it true that money can't buy happiness? The jury is still out on that one, but it's enabled people like Walter Wolf, Eiichi Okato, Shinjiro Fukuda, and many others to follow their passions and build their dreams. In another case, an employee at Lamborghini used money he took out on a personal loan to buy an autoclave to build the Countach Evolutioni, a crazy carbon fiber Kevlar Countach. This employee was Horatio Pagani. Yes, that Pagani. But that's a story for another day. As always, I want to thank you so much for supporting the channel and my own passion for making these videos. Seeing people engage with the stories has been really inspiring and I want to continue doing my best to make each video a little bit better than the one before it. This video was a ton of research and I want to thank Auto Team Retro for once again helping me to cut through the fog surrounding Midnight. Finally, thanks to all of your support, the channel has its first sponsor. And it's a good one. While most of us won't ever be able to justify buying a Lamborghini, and this is probably the closest I'll ever even get to one, sometimes it is worth treating yourself, especially to items you use every day, like your wallet. I recently traded out my awkward old bulky one for this new high quality extra wallet. It has all kinds of neat features, but this is the most satisfying one. In addition to easy card access, this wallet is slim and lightweight, something which I think many car enthusiasts can appreciate. I went full time attack mode and opted for the carbon fiber, but there are all kinds of different options, and some people even match their wallet to their car's interior. These wallets come with an RFID backing plate to protect yourself from wireless theft, and you can get a solar powered tracking device to make sure you never lose it again. If you're interested in picking up your own extra wallet, you can find the link down below in the description and use code HUNTERSMOON for 25% off until November 3rd. Again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and have a great day.